to have someone who's new to Christ and never spoke publicly in front of a crowd and stand up here and read the Word of God, this is what happens in this church. Because this is God's church. And God's Spirit's in this church. Amen. Amen. So we are going to start a new series, Standing on the Word of God. Standing on the Word of God. Started a long time ago, several months ago, Calling on the Name of the Lord. And then we just finished following the Spirit of God. And so now we are standing on the Word of God. Mackenzie grew up in a Bible church. She, uh, she began learning about God's Word even before she could read. And after moving up through the Sunday school grades, she really, truly enjoyed being in the church's youth group. Her parents supported Mackenzie's decision to attend a very esteemed university, thinking that the degree from this university would serve her better in her career than one from a Christian college. Now Mackenzie is home, and she's home on semester break, and, and uh, she texted her friend Terry, who was her favorite youth group leader, and so Terry and her are having coffee. And after the small talk, McKinsey confides, I think I'm losing my faith. And her sister says, wow, what happened? And she says, my doubts started at the beginning of my freshman year, and they've only gotten worse. I, I thought that they would go away. I thought that they would go away if I prayed more and if I started reading the Bible more, but they haven't gone away. Um, I, I don't know what to do. As a science major, McKinsey was seeing in the natural world too much complexity for there not to be a purposeful creator. And she still believes in God. She's just having a lot of trouble with the Bible. And... Um, Shortly before the semester break, one of her classes was called uh, Literature. And uh, her professor spent two full weeks on a series of lectures in his class titled The Bible, Mythic History or Historic Myth, where the, prof the professor attacked the reliability and the authenticity of Scripture making three profound statements to the class. Statement number one, listen. There is no significant historical or archaeological support for believing that the Bible is historically accurate. Point number two the professor made. There is little textual evidence to support the claims of the Bible aside from a few ancient and inconsistent scraps. Point number three. Modern science has made it impossible to believe that the Bible is trustworthy. So McKinsey asks, Terry, what do I do? How can I keep believing the Bible when there are so many problems with it? Imagine if you were Terry in that coffee shop. Terry said nothing at first because she realized this is probably not so much about whether the Bible's reliable or not as much as her friend is losing her faith. Do you see that? And do you see how the Word of God is tied to our faith inseparably? Can you see that? And so Terry purposed, and she said, I don't really know how to answer those skeptical questions, but I do know you, and I know you love God. Hmm. There's a uh, reality of our day that McKinsey is not alone. There's a growing percentage of Americans who doubt the word of God is flawless. They 
been hearing challenges to the reliability of the scripture for decades, and they're hearing that from the greatest influences of our culture, higher education, and media. Media being newspapers and movies, magazines, especially TV, and now even more than TV, and even more than the traditional media, social media, is now having a huge detrimental impact on people's confidence in the Word of God. And so most younger people, when I say younger, I'm talking about people under 30, they don't get their news from traditional sources. They get them from social media, overwhelmingly from social media. Now, what's the difference? Traditional uh, media, they have reporters who've gone to college to learn how to investigate and then how to write out what they've investigated and discovered, and they're sharing that. But social media is, well, this is what I think. And that's all the training going into it. And so if a person's going to Instagram or TikTok or YouTube for their news, uh, it, who knows what the qualification of the person posting the comment has? What gives them the right to even speak on such a thing? But you see, in social media, that doesn't matter. Because on social media, I don't even have to tell you what my real name is and where I live. I can make a statement to the entire world and no one will know who I am and what I am and whether I'm telling the truth or not. Or whether I'm even a bit able to talk about the thing that I'm spouting about, you see. This is the problem with seeking Truth through social means. It doesn't take long to figure out there's an agenda in our culture, and it is anti-Bible in nature. Hey, when was the last time you saw a special on TV or, or on your screen? And, and at the end of that special, uh, they said, there is no question in our minds that we can trust the Bible as it is written today. When was the last time you saw that in a special? What are you laughing at? That's not how they end up, is it? The Bible is an inspiring word. It's inspired millions. It's changed the lives of millions of people across the, t the ages. But, right, and that's the rest of the program. And the takeaway from all these specials and the insidious part of this is, family, they do it during Easter. At a moment when we should be thinking about God and what he has said about what Jesus did for us, they, they, they launch these programs, and they always feature these professors who are professors of theology in the most liberal colleges we have. They never question anyone who comes from our stripe of the church who believes that everything in here is reliable. They never feature them. They don't get invited to the camera. What they get invited to is someone who's got a bunch of degrees and maybe has written some books, and basically the books are saying this, yeah, it's a great book, but we really can't trust this part of it. Hmm. And so there are forces in our lives today and, and another force in our lives today is this staunchly anti-authority movement within our land. We've always been independent. I mean, our first war had the name independence, and we've been independent ever since. The Civil War was about independence, where the southern states were not going to let the northern tell them how to do their business. We are an independent people. We are always challenging and questioning, and if we see something or hear something we don't like, we will protest. We will pressure to get our way. That is an Americanism right there. And we have a culture that doesn't like being told what they must do. Are you in agreement? So you can see why there would be a movement to criticize and undermine the Word of God because, well, the Word of God is going to confront my morality now, isn't it? 
The Bible isn't going to say, hey, you can just keep on being like that and you're fine and dandy. So since the Bible is critical of things that I value and things that I cherish and things that are super important in my life, so if I want to feel good about myself and I don't want to have the guilt associated with what's coming out of this book, then what I need to do is remove its authority. Question whether it has the right to judge me. There's the term, right? Isn't that the term of the day? You've never had anybody look you in the eye and go, hey, don't judge me. What are you smiling at? Because you know it's true, isn't it? People are hypersensitive about being evaluated negatively. No, you can praise them forever. But don't point out, some of you have friends that you've, you've known for a long time and you've been very affirming and encouraging and you pointed out one thing that they needed to hear and they dropped you like a hot potato. All the texts, all the calls, gone. Years and years of love, support, being there, helping, encouraging, helping someone come out of a tragedy. You were the one who was there because Christ called you to help that friend of yours, and you were there for them. And then in just one moment, you said something about something in their life, their lifestyle. And you are what? Ghosted. The old term is persona non grata, which means you're not welcome around here anymore. We live in a culture that resists authority and will not tolerate you pointing out something about me I don't want you to say. So it makes sense. The Bible's unpopular in America. But I'm going to tell you what troubles me more than the statements I've already made so far. I'm talking about those outside the kingdom, those outside church buildings. What disturbs me more is what I'm reading and hearing coming out of church buildings in America today. I am far more concerned about this than I am what I've already said. Popular churches that are professing to love Scripture are denying its very supremacy in faith and practice. Pastors are elevating cultural cues above the clear teachings of Scripture. And these churches, instead of defending the inerrancy of God's Word, these priests and these pastors cast doubt about statements made in the New Testament especially when they have something to do with topics that make people in their buildings uncomfortable. Am I right? Did I lose you? Are you still with me? I'm not even getting started. I need you here, okay? It's like we love the Bible. The Bible says what it is and, and all that. And, uh, but yeah, you know, we can't really talk about that because if we do that, we're going to lose some people. So they don't talk about it. And they keep getting more people. It's not just avoiding what it does say. There's this insinuation that throughout time, somehow from the time that it was written by the original writers to now, it's been corrupted and we can't really trust it. This is the great criticism of our day. And I am not talking about those outside the church. I'm talking about those who attend churches in America. There are churches that are saying, well, you know, Paul was a chauvinist and a misogynist. And therefore, if he starts talking about the role of women, well, he's disqualified. He isn't even married. And that's coming from a preacher in a pulpit. I was under the impression, I don't know if you are, but I was under the impression that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he claimed several times, if I'm saying it, the Lord is saying it to me through the Holy Spirit. Which means what? That's his opinion? Hmm. So, there is a 
disturbing trend. It used to be outside of Christianity. The one I'm more concerned about is the one that is growing within Christendom today. And this thing I'm talking about is even happening in the evangelical part of Christendom. Now, I don't know if you know these are terms. They're, in, in, in Christendom, there are all kinds of different churches and denominations and of all stripes and all kinds. And within those churches, there are two primary uh, 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 groups. There are those that we would term liberal. And this doesn't mean politically liberal. It means that they are liberal in the sense of, of, of not having to take everything this says literally. That we, are, we, are, we have liberty to make our minds up about things, the Bible addressed 2,000 years ago, that we no longer need to do. Liberal means theologically liberal. Means that, that, that this book isn't a literal commandment that has to be done forever, but it is a book of instructions to guide us as we decide for ourselves what's best today. That's the liberal theologian. On the other side are evangelicals. Evangelicals believe the Bible is God's word. They are fundamental, meaning if it's in there, I'm obligated to do it. That's what that means. Evangelicals are people who says, I think that we don't have the right to change what this says. God said it. God meant it. God still means it. That's an evangelical, a uh, true evangelical. So, George Barna uh, has an evangelical uh, research ministry. It's like Pew Research or Gallup, but for the evangelical church. In 2004, he did a survey, and it really upset people that read it because he stated the results of this survey, by the way, to pastors, preachers, and priests, okay, of all kinds, both sides, everyone. And he came to the conclusion, statistically it was obvious, that only half of Protestant preachers hold a biblical worldview. Now, thankfully, Barna explained to us what a biblical worldview is. It's not very complex. Listen to it. it, it it's based on six core beliefs. The accuracy of biblical teaching, the sinless nature of Jesus Christ, the literal existence of Satan, the omnipotence and omniscience of God, salvation is by grace, and the personal responsibility to evangelize. Meaning, I trust the Bible as God's word as written. Jesus never sinned. There is a devil. The shocking part of this, only 48% of those who responded think that he is real. I have to get you to understand this. These are pulpiteers, people. These are pulpiteers. People are doing what I'm doing this very day. Half of those who are Protestant in America believe the devil is real. The others say he was made up. He's not an actual personality. Oh, man, that's stunning in itself, isn't it? Salvation is by grace. Amen. And we have a personal responsibility to talk to other people about their soul. Barna concludes, the point is, you cannot give people what you don't have. And the low percentage of Christians who have a biblical worldview is a direct reflection of of the fact that half of our primary religious leaders and teachers do not possess one. So, here we are. What is the most important thing? If you have your Bible, John 18, which Dave read to us earlier, 
John 18. What's the single most important thing? What is more important than anything else? Ready? Truth. Say it. That's the most important thing. The single greatest, most important thing is that truth exists. That truth, more than anything, is this. You know it's for certain. Now, whether it's the truth about your physical condition or whether it's the truth about your spiritual condition, truth is what matters most. So it's no surprise that people who are influenced by their flesh or by the devil assert that truth cannot be discovered. It cannot be absolute. It cannot be enforced. And this is the philosophy of our modern world outside of Christianity, that truth is abstract. Or the term they're really using is it's relative. Meaning your truth is your truth and your truth is your truth and your truth is your truth. There is no absolutely true truth. This is the philosophy of our world. In our reading, Jesus tells Pilate, who is the governor of that area, the highest ranking Roman person in the entire region, and he tells Pilate, the governor, why he came to earth. Pilate says, so you're a king. Well, you say that I'm a king. Watch this, verse uh, 37 of, of John 18. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. What is that, Jesus? Why did you come here? For God so loved the world. Yeah, we know that, but this is a different statement. For this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the... What's your Bible say? Okay, are you guys reading with me? Here we go. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate is fascinated. Believe me, this isn't the first time he asked this question. And I guarantee you all his contemporaries were asking this question. What is truth? What is truth? What is truth? And so here's here, standing in front of this man who's really turning Jerusalem upside down. And he has an opportunity to interview him. And Jesus said, the reason I'm here is to, real, to bear witness to God's truth. And, the, and Pilate asked him, what is truth? So, what is truth? Truth is the way it really is. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's a good definition, isn't it? Truth is the way it really is. Or another way of saying it, truth is reality. Right? Everybody say that. Truth is reality. Hmm. The most important truth is the truth that tells you the way things actually truly are in reality. And especially when that has something to do with your soul and your destiny. Understanding the truth is what matters most. The night before this conversation with Pilate, Jesus was in the garden and he was praying to his heavenly father on, on our behalf. It's called the intercessory prayer. But basically, Jesus was in the garden and he was praying to the father. And in John 17 and verse 17, he says, talking to the father in heaven, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus telling the Father, I'm asking that you sanctify these, the ones that, that he's praying for, including us. Sanctify them in the truth. And then he tells us what the truth is. What's the truth according to Jesus? What did Jesus tell the Father the truth was? Thank you. 
Is this the truth? According to Jesus, this is reality. This is reality. If you want to know reality according to God, if you want to know the truth, all you have to do is open up your Bible and read it. And you'll see it. So, this is the introductory message. I need to form some foundations. Already laid some concrete, haven't I? Yes. But let me finish up with a couple more items here. The Bible is not a, just a book of ideas, opinions, and principles. The Bible is not a waiting for us to read it and consider what is said and be inspired by what we've considered. Now, does it do that? Yeah, absolutely. But the Word of God is much more than a book to inspire our spirituality. And I want you to know that phrase is hugely popular in certain churches today. Inspire our spirituality. That's the, that's the hot topic right there. That's the buzzer, okay? It is the thoughts and concerns of the Almighty God. It's what He thinks. It's what we're to think. It's His commands. It's His uh, decrees. It's His laws. The, the, the Word of God is, is His will. It's His will. That's why it's called a testament. It's His will and testament. More on that later. Because the book is literally the word of God, then it makes sense that God says, do not ignore it and do not change it as you see fit. Which is exactly the very reason why I think this series is so important. Because people are changing what it says to fit a lifestyle that is prohibited by Scripture. And so... God's word carries, oh, point number two. The Bible is not written to be interpreted any way the reader wants. Gee, man, one of the most agonizingly frustrating statements that Christians say is, well, the, the scripture is open to interpretation. And you know what that means? You can walk out of it, uh, you can read this and, and interpret it Way, and you can read it and interpret it your way, and you can read it and interpret it your way, and you can have your own way, and I have my own interpretation, they have their interpretation, that church has their interpretation. Nothing more frustrating than that. Because what that implies is that God wrote it and didn't care how you read it. I don't, I'm going to have to play that back on YouTube. I'm not sure how that came out. I think what I meant to say that when God wrote this, he didn't say, well, I hope you figure out what I'm talking about. And if you read completely different things out of it, at least you'll be inspired. Listen, do you have a will in your safe that when you die, it'll direct what you want done with your estate? Yes or no? Okay, some of you do. Do you want somebody later on going, well, I don't really like subparagraph 8. Because I think I deserve the muscle car. Okay. My point is, it's a testament. And, and, and when, when you start getting legal about stuff, it's not that we can just go in there and change the law to fit what we're wanting to get done. And people read the Word of God, and it's like, well, you know, that church sees it this way. And, that, and it's all fine. Whatever. Hey, no big deal. Hey, they love God. They worship God. Everybody's good. We're never going to come to agreement. All right. God's word carries authority because of who authored it. God's word is written so that we would know what that God thinks. So, is the Bible believable? That's a good question. People outside this building are asking that question. Some people, even inside here, most likely are struggling. I don't know if this Bible is relevant anymore. I don't know if what I'm reading is what was actually written. I don't know if what, I'm, uh, what my grandparents and parents and other people in this congregation love, I don't know if I can trust this. And that's the reason why this series is so critical. 
Is it accurate? We're going to find out. Is it without error? We're going to find out. Is it still God's word or has it been corrupted through all the ages? We are going to find out. I need to equip you on how to answer those questions. Can you believe the Bible, family? Yes. Is it the word of God? Yes. Did it come from the mouth of God? Yes. It is God-breathed. And it's written down. And God loves us that much to not only write this book with incredible pain and struggle and cost, but he protected it so that what you're reading is what he said. Right? He is God, isn't he? All right. Here's our final verse. Next slide. Oh, there's no more. To That's a good point. I'll have to preach about that later. All right, here we go. Is it reliable? Yes. Has it been corrupted? No. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Wow, that's a fantastic verse. Well, we just got started. Concrete's laid. Let's let it cure for a week, and we'll start building, okay? You got something on your heart moving you, moving you to uh, seek encouragement, study. Maybe you need to get into the Word, and you haven't. Maybe you need what the power is here, and, and you need the Spirit's power in your life greater. If any of that is relevant, let us know as we stand up and sing.